bring your mind out of the circle <coughs> you are going now. Have you ever considered yourself as a technology? I will leave the question with you and I will share my story on environmental, driving environmental performance. In my 10 years of experience, I've been uh, involved in developing sometimes very complex um, industrial optimization projects for countries. Uh, most times for regions. Uh, I'm currently developing one for 16 countries in Africa. And this is going to be a Jeff funded project. And um, one of the questions that were posed to Ross, basically to me, why developing the, the, the project was what technology are you bringing? What kind of innovation that we've not seen before are you bringing um, into the, I mean, will you be introducing one to increase the productivity of the companies, the selected companies in this country? And these, com these, com these companies, they cut across major sectors. It took me quite a while to understand the question because I have not been seeing myself as a technology. Now, let me go around it a little bit. Sometimes there are no technologies. You don't have a technology for a problem, whether you like it or not. You will go to some companies, there is a problem, but you don't know how to solve it. You will not be able to solve it. And that is where you as a person becomes a technology by giving the right advice, which will turn out to be something into optimization. Optimization of a process, optimization of either uh, water usage, energy, material inflow, and management of um, the eventual waste that will come from the product or from the production to the product. Now, um, driving performances mm -hmm. in Africa, I mean, environmental performances, in my opinion, we need to start looking at things differently. Most companies that are here on the podium where we are looking at just, I mean, the goal should not just be on the opportunities that lies on um, country A moving into country B, but rather um, it should also look at how my intervention, what problem with my, with my intervention costs in me moving from country A to country B. So the technologies we will be looking at here, or the first thing we as technologists uh, we as a technology, as humans, will be, are we going to be doing things in the right way? Are there policies in these countries? In the, in the, in the early 18th century, you heard, of, you, heard, you heard of the gold rush in America. A whole land, a whole region was, regions were plundered. A environmental impact, some are, some are still uh, trying to get out of it. The gold rush started because money was the driving force. Mm -hmm. And so, how to mine the gold was not really, uh, how to mine the gold sustainably, I mean, preserving the environment at the same time, getting your gold, we are not really put into a, a lot of consideration. And this is what we should be looking at. Are we going to be producing a unit of gold, a bottle of water, in the right way. When we start asking that ourselves that questions, those kind of questions, and coming up with at least a near possible solution, then we are already driving the environmental performances in the countries. Then we are already presenting ourselves as a veritable technology that can be implemented wherever, X, Y, Z country. i give you an example again. We, I just happened to do a back-to-back a -back mission uh, on my, some of the projects we are doing and we are trying to do with, with the techno technological assessments on some key industries in key sectors in Kenya and also in South Africa. We find out that 
from one of our assessments, we assessed a sugar cane, a sugar production company. This company is doing very well. While at the same time, while doing very well in producing sugar at a very, very cheap rate for the Kenyans, they were doing that at the detriment of the environment because they were producing a whole lot of bagasse, which traps methane gas. So um, actually, they're a major contributor to uh, emission, I mean, GH, uh, uh, green gas uh, uh, gases. Now, we have to start thinking, how can we get rid of these tons of bagasse? Should we convert it into energy? Briketing came up. Yes, the company said we're going to buy into this and we're going to start using, um, converting the backyards, but they have to reduce the water content. And again, we ourselves, because there is no technology, we have to sit on the table and say, okay, how can we get this done? Reduce the water content in the backyards from 50% to 10% so that they can break it and who will use it. So we saw ourselves as the technology, we saw ourselves designing a new technology that has not been implemented in that sector, in the sugarcane sector in Kenya. And in that process, we already saw the use of what the bagasse, the, the waste, if it is briquetted, I mean, put into briquet, it can serve as a biomass for another company which we assessed, that is a tea company. So I think we should look at the whole process. Uh, I think you, you've used the term, the life cycle analysis. It's not actually the end, but actually the beginning. And the beginning starts with us as humans having the right thoughts, which can be considered as a technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, what I'm talking about is a cradle-to-cradle -cradle, yeah. uh, mentality. Yeah. So, for example, um, Interface is a carpet, it's an American carpet company. So they created this idea, I believe, in the 1990s with a, with a chemist. And so this idea has now expanded, has become a standard, and they're trying to also create innovations um, in different industries. But what Interface is now doing is they're going to places such as, I think it was the Philippines, and they're asking for people, they actually employ small fishing villages, and so the, fishing, uh, the people in the fishing villages go out and they dive for plastic bags. Because obviously we know there's too much dumping, plastic dumping in our oceans and what the negative effects are. Um, but they're not doing this as a, as a charity. They earn money with this. So when they collect enough plastic, it gets weighed and then they get paid a rate for, for the, the plastic. So they know that what they're doing is good because they know that they're cleaning the oceans, but they're also earning a living. So it's also created an industry for, uh, for the plastic bags. And so with the plastic bags, that are collected in the Philippines, they get sent off and then it gets turned into carpeting. So one of the things is to look at it in a, in a different business model. I mean, right now we say, this is an item, I own this item, and when I'm finished with it, I throw it away and I don't own it anymore. But it's an idea of changing the concept and saying, you know, maybe I rent it or maybe, you know, I share it. So I think that it has more to do with changing our mentality about economics and, and also with the sharing economy, not only having, let's say, the, the big policies where, where, let's say, the UN or national governments are thinking about this, but where we have also have the grass, grassroots movements, but, so we're moving from both sides, so we're moving from the bottom up and from the top down, and then we also need to have innovations in different areas, because this is a complex society. But when we have that, then we'll start to reach our goals. That's what I believe. Thank you very much. So, um, we've reviewed quite a few opportunities nevertheless. The ones in recycling for profit, and that also is not just about technology itself, it's about capacity building. So the human is actually the driving force for um, improving the environmental performance um, of countries full stop. Now, um, I would like to stick to the topic of technology because I do believe technology is a common thread to um, meet the issues that many countries face. And uh, I believe also in agriculture, the more technology you adopt, uh, the more you produce. But it's also a contradiction because when you overproduce, 
it leads to deforestation and also the degra degradation of the soil. Now, I would like to speak to our agricultural <laughs> scientists in this regard. Um, there are a lot of smart farming techniques that are currently being adopted <coughs> in Africa using smartphones, apps, or just simply SMSs. In your experience, do you see a future in this? Or do you believe that it's actually going to turn things worse than it was before? Surely, I'm very, very optimistic in this area. <clears throat> we have, for example, here, we have the, the farmers' partnership. Like farmers producing certain products will relate to other farmers who will buy the products. Example, we have the animal farmers in the district producing animal. The other job is just to produce animal. We have other farmers producing uh, feeds like cassava, like bees. Their job is to produce cassava. They can connect to each other. Mm -hmm. I am producing cassava. I don't care how much I produce. I don't care how to use it. The animal farms, farmers say, I, I need cassava to feed my animal. I don't care what way it is being produced. So this connection with smartphones mm -hmm. is very, very effective. And it is effective now that we have, like, I give us a of West Africa, like we have the, the um, Lone Star, which is in Nigeria, is really making this positive mm -hmm. for the people around West African countries. MTN will come to Liberia with uh, Lone Star, with Cellcom, and mesh together to enhance this opportunity for the farmers. So we are really enjoying this opportunity there that farmers now can connect with each other to say, I am producing this, I need this. So the opportunity that the overproduction in Africa is not a very big problem. We have a big problem of marketing. You see, food production is not our problem. If you produce and cannot sell it, what do you do? You stop producing. If you produce and you can market it, what do you do? You come to produce. So you see, if we can encourage our farmers in area of market system, they can always produce. So we have this, this, um, this sustainability we are talking about here in agriculture. It starts from there. If I produce maize in a year, and I cannot sell it. Next year, I will produce any other maize. Yeah? So you see, what we are doing, it is a farmer's partnership in, in Liberia, is functioning very well. Don't forget, this country, and I was 14 years of civil war, they have no identity any longer. We were sent there to encourage the farmers to start production. Now they are producing. What happens to the products being destroyed? So our job is to establish agribusiness among the, farm, among the farmers. So we try to connect farmers to farmers with smartphones. Mm -hmm. It's very, 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 very possible. So I think it's a very good technology. Ambassador Kitonga, would you be able to add in your take in what Kenya is doing um, in order to merge technology with agricultural production without impacting to a negative sense of the environment. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. In fact, as uh, my fellow panelists was uh, talking, uh, there's something that came to mind. And uh, we have a, a, a service provider, mobile service pro provider, Safaricom, which has what you call an ESA. So in terms of how you're connecting farmers and in terms of how they use technology to their benefit. M-Pesa is, is like a finance system, a banking system, where, for instance, if uh, I have somebody or I have a farm and I would like to buy seeds or, or, or to, you know, to, to, to have the bank, uh, money bank uh, from, uh, from what I have benefited from the, from the land, I can use the M-Pesa system. M-Pesa system is a very interesting system. It enables, it is widespread uh, in all uh, mobile uh, uh, people who are 
have uh, are connected to Safaricom are able to use this facility and it's a very good system where uh, Kenyans are benefiting enormously in terms of transmitting finances from one point to another. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, maybe I can also mention that Kenya is one of the first, fastest, has one of the fastest growing economies in Africa and we encourage uh, foreign direct investment. In fact, one of our areas of priority is economic diplomacy. So we are cooperating with, with other countries, including Austria, and for instance, in this region, Hungary and Slovakia, where we, we try and embrace new, newer technologies, uh, newer farming methods. Of course, uh, one of the challenges is lack of, uh, of uh, farmers having the finance to introduce some of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. But these technologies are, are definitely being used for the farming now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have to round up soon. So I've got one more question going to Jonathan. In regards to the windmills, um, I believe that, especially in this part of the world, uh, in Europe, there has been a lot of opposition of windmills because of it impairing the landscape. Um, do you believe that there's some truth to it, uh, or is it just the media talking? Well, there are many different uh, points of views for windmills in general, and I don't really want to take a position in the in the big wind industry. I don't, I don't want to oppose it, and I don't want to say yeah, it's really good and we put, we put it everywhere. Because I work with uh, small wind turbines up to maybe five or six meters in diameter, and this is not so much of a topic in my uh, in my branch. So there is mostly they are accepted in this size as something interesting, some interesting machine. Actually, when it comes to large wind energy systems, of course, there are different points of views, and you can say doesn't really look nice or I don't like it and other people say I really like it because it produces uh, uh, renewable energy so yeah there, there are ups and downs of course and I've, my personal opinion is that if, if you put them somewhere where they don't really uh, disturb anyone then it's fine but I wouldn't really like them a hundred meters next to my house talking about big, big, big uh, wind turbines the small machines, it's different. You can put them anywhere, and they are not so big that they have really disturb a lot of people by, by the optical, by the appearance, physical appearance. And how much voltage has the smaller one got, or how much does it produce? I well, say? Uh, it depends where you put it, of course, okay. and if you, and also about the size is, a, is an important factor. If you have a yeah, let's say a, an example of, of wind turbines that I work with. If you put them somewhere where you have a, a good windy site with a, with a constant stream of wind and no obstacles around, then you can have enough energy to power a house. And that's not a problem in this size. But of course you can have much less if you put them on the wrong side. So it's hard to really say a number. Mm -hmm. It depends on many factors. Okay. And how, mu how much time do you take to produce one of those wind fields that yeah, what, what I do is that I go around and I teach courses where we build a wind turbine and I don't produce them and sell them basically, I, I just uh, come there and then I have a group of people, mostly it's local people, for example I was in Germany last week and we had uh, a group of 12 people from a village and these people sign up to this course and then we build a wind turbine together and I prepare all the materials and the tools so we build it following a, a well-developed design, of course, not something random. It all has uh, some, some way to go and it's, it's developed. And after, after this course, the wind turbine is the finished product of this group. And it goes somewhere where it will be installed and then produce electricity for a project. In this case, it was in Germany, it was for a sustainable building uh, structure of building a company project where they build houses with low energy demands is like the passive house but it's not exactly like this something different and then it will be used there for electricity it will be used there and produce electricity and the outcome of the project in the end is that people gain knowledge about the wind energy system 
the participants in the course. And you have the, the turbine itself, and that is also a product that fits days for a group of around 10 people to complete the project and the process of building it. And yeah, that's it basically. Thank you. The, another, another important thing is the cost of the materials in the end, because the people build it in the course, it's, it's, it's only the materials basically. Uh, it's about three to five hundred euros, depending on what, what source of materials you can use, or if you have recycled materials that you can use, you don't have to buy new ones. And it's cheaper, of course, and if you buy everything, then it's more expensive. Thank you very much. Where can we sign up for your courses? Uh, you can sign up for the courses on the website. My website is called pureselfmade.com and there is uh, a list where you can uh, write your email address down and then you will get notification about the next course happening. And uh, it's not so many courses are public actually. I would like to do more public things, but it's mostly booked by closed groups like universities or NGOs or something. But there are some public events on the website. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we met in Kenya. We, of the, I mean, we crossed the equator just in Nyaururu, Your Excellency? Yes. In Nyaururu. Um, there you have, uh, it's, it's a resort. It's more like a, a tourist uh, uh, town. And in this story style, there was a, a, the KCC, the new KCC, which uh, just last week or last month, the Vice Deputy President was there. Now, as you will all understand, in developing countries or in emerging countries, one of the problems, one of the challenges they have towards um, prosperity, industrial development and poverty elevation is energy. How can they generate energy either for the primary industry, industries, I'm talking about on-farm, off-farm, processing, and the rest. And then the secondary industries where the package, the, it goes, it goes across the, 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 the whole sector, either from heavy duty manufacturing uh, sectors to on-farm, off-farm processing. And this is where uh, we had a very um, challenging, mind-boggling, I would say, experience in Kenya. There is a creamery company. The shareholders are 45% the Kenyan government and 65% uh, farmers. And so these are cattle rearers where they collect milk, process it, I mean, put it in a cold storage somewhere and they send it to the creamery for packaging and processing. One of the problems this creamery or this milk processing company is having is energy. They have to run their boilers and furnace oil. Now you have to know what furnace oil is. Furnace oil is more like the oil with the cheap, the, the cargo, um, Ships, after docking at the ports, they have to discharge this oil and then these heavy duty machineries or industries, they buy this oil, still at a very high price and they use it. So it's contributing to carbon emission on the one hand because they burn for some oil, and at the same time it's very, very expensive. This creamery, in a year, they spend a million dollars on energy. You have to think about it. We were shouting, how can you spend a million dollars on energy just to run your factory in a year and at the same time still make profit? It's, it's really expensive. And that is where technology has to gain. And we, we, we have to look on how to, because in the entire production, 70% of the production costs go into energy either on diesel fuel, furnace fuel, and also on electricity. In fact, in this rural area, electricity was not even a consideration. It was a standby. It, they don't run on electricity, or on the main grid. So they run on furnace fuel and diesel. So the carbon footprint is way high. The cost of production is way high. 
And we have to think on what kind of technology, on one hand, that is appropriate, that is doable within a given period of time, has a maintenance team on ground, that can substitute the, um, the, 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 the fossil fuel, the burning of the fossil fuel. We did the linkage and we saw that the waste coming from the production of sugarcane, the bagasse, when briqueted, can be used as a biomass for a boiler. So that was one of the appropriate technologies that we suggested. And again, that would draw down their cost of production uh, from 70% to around 17 to 18%. So the company can be making up to about uh, between 500 to 600,000 as profit when that energy uh, problem is fixed. And that is what we're talking about, the uh, technology that should drive performances of industries, reduce carbon footprint, and at the same time make sure that we have um, milk at the shelves at affordable prices and can be used. Which brings me to what uh, Jonathan is doing. In a whole lot of African communities, maybe also in Asian communities, in India, Southeast Asia, you find out that when they produce on farm and they want to process off farm, what they need is a cooling chain. For you to produce a tomato and to take it to the market, your distance from your production, that is your farm, to the market is a three days. Within three days, if you produce, if you have vegetable your tomato, and you cannot take it to the market under a temperature of, let's say, above 50 degrees, your tomato will half, 75% of that is gone. So you have to see how you can modulate, regulate the temperature. You also have to think of how to transport your, your, um, your goods to the market across the value chain. So um, if you have a cooling chain, or you have at least at some points along the value chain um, windmills that can generate <coughs> electricity to uh, do some, I mean, power some cooling uh, showers, either for tomato or any other perishable products within which has a life plan or a shelf or a travel span of three days, you have already contributed to not only increasing, and in this case, renewable energy, so you are talking about low burning of fossil fuels, your, your carbon emission is reduced almost to minimum, and you are increasing your, you know, you are improving uh, performance. And you're making more profit. And you're making more profit, you are elevating more people from, uh, uh, I mean, giving opportunity, economic empowerment to to the, to the producers, in this case the farmers, <coughs> the, um, the, 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 the marketers, and even the consumers. So, technology is the key. I believe to industrialize, to move people from poverty uh, thresholds, irrespective of the region or the, the community, technology plays a whole lot um, in the whole process. Thank you very much for this closing. I have to end it here okay. because we're stick, we have to stick to time. Talk about, uh, when you're talking about, mm -hmm. when you talk about perishable capital building, yeah, I, I was a bit moved because uh, <coughs> this uh, small scale technology you are talking about is very, very efficient. What is that? We have this uh, um, container they use to transport goods to Africa. They are lying everywhere. So what, what, is that, what can you do with these containers? You build the containers, it's a solar container, yeah, mobile solar container for the storage of the product. The containers are divided into compartments, they, are, they can be mobile or stationary. At the marketplaces, where the women, after selling their goods, they cannot take them home because they will get them. They store them in the container. It is cheap, it's easy to do, and I've constructed one, and I will tell you the cost of it, 10,000 euros. To 20 feet container, which can last for at least 25 years. What do I use? It's the solar technique. So, uh, solar. Solar. Okay, to cool down. To cool down the, the, the 
temperatures. Okay. Yeah, so solar is built on top of the container. Mm -hmm. so you, you divide the container into compartments mm -hmm. to the temperature degrees. Mm -hmm. If you are if you have meat, you have a lower temperature. If you have vegetables, higher temperature, just like this. Mm -hmm. Define it. It's very, very effective and it is functional in utility districts in Bonk County in Liberia. Just to inform you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very useful information as well because what has transpired in this conversation is that renewable energy is actually the solution to driving environmental performance in emerging markets. Actually, we can, you can't produce as much renewable energy from a unit of renewables as you can from fossil fuel. So fossil fuel is more efficient from a caloric perspective. What we need to do is plan things really carefully. Choose our technologies selectively and conserve as much of our resources as possible. Before, we, and for example, cooling, I mean, 40% of all energy is actually used in buildings. So that's why conserving the energy and using a passive house technology, that's only one, there's other ones, um, is very important. Because once we, we have finite resources, and you know, using, let's say, cooling needs, let's say, three times more energy than heating. And so obviously, the whole continent of Africa is a cooling, uh, has a cooling demand. So having, and also the distribution losses are then um, reduced when you're using it, let's say, for transporting um, goods such as, what, I'm sorry, I forget his name, but uh, in Liberia, but this is, Festus, thank you. This is, this is an efficient technology, but we have to also make sure that there's enough insulation so that there isn't, so that the coolness is not going to be lost during transport as well. Mm -hmm. sorry. That's all right. Thank you for your contribution. I do agree that fossil fuel is useful and more effective. However, a lot of African countries are trying to wean themselves yeah. off. I just mean from a caloric perspective, <coughs> we should not be using fossil fuels. I'm saying that the replacement is renewable energies, mm -hmm. but we have to also have conservation in our strategies for using renewable energies because you cannot replace it one on one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to open up the floor now for questions. Thank you very much for the wonderful, distinguished panel. Um, can you please give them a round of applause? Thank you. So we will have to actually take one of the microphones to the, to the back. Or actually, if you could, uh, if you have any questions, if you could just stand up, state your name. And uh, yeah, you're clearing. Please don't be shy. Okay, we've got two hands here. Please, you and then you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Shannon. Thank you very much for the really interesting talk. So we've got a lot about different technologies we can use to be more efficient. But I think a really big question is how to implement these technologies and uh, uh, to the, and the, the other big question is how will the people who have to use these technologies accept them? Because I only know it for the passive house. It's even in Vienna, which is a really strong passive house city. It's hard that um, yeah architects, for example, accept the passive house standards because there's more easier ways to build buildings. Thank you very much.